In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation, and it's always a great joy to be with all of you. And as always, we like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church, and Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. We also invoke Mary as our, as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's, uh, together as a family, start off our prayer. to Mary Most Holy, saying the prayer that she loves. Most is the Hail Mary, the also known as the Angelic Salutation. So let's pray. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners. Now, and at the hour of our death, <coughs> amen. Now, friends, let's uh, lift our gaze and our hearts to our spiritual director. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. What a great grace and privilege it is to have as our spiritual director the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has many wonderful titles. Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. Holy Spirit is also known as the Gift of Gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the Sweet Guest of the Soul. Holy Spirit is also known as our consoler as well as our counselor holy spirit is also known as the sanctifier he who makes us holy holy spirit is our interior master our interior master. St. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, says this, that we really don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can Call out Abba, Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's pray the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit as we enter into our conversation today. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful, By the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise, 
and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. St. Teresa of Avila, <coughs> pray for us. St. Francis Xavier, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So my friends, the family that prays together stays together and world at prayer is a world at peace. So after starting off by praying with you, I promise that I'll pray for you. I'll pray with you and now I'll pray for you in the holy sacrifice of the mass which is the prayer par excellence. No greater prayer than the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So I'd like to offer the following intentions. First will be to pray that all of us would be open to the Holy Spirit and that this would be our prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. <clears throat> come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the Heart of Mary. My second intention, my second intention will be pray for our families, for the conversion, the sanctification, and the salvation of our of our family. The conversion, the salvation, and the sanctification of our family. Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in the process? Then I'd like to pray in a special way for this group of people, the dying. That they would open up their hearts and beg for God's infinite mercy. So those will be my intentions in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. 
Now, what I've been doing since the beginning of the new year is before we get into the readings for the day and the saint of the day, I've been giving a brief catechesis. What I'm doing is I'm going through the creed. We've already gone through, I believe in God. We talked about the present danger of agnosticism, militant atheism, dogmatic atheism, and practical atheism. We spoke about that. Then earlier this week, we spoke about, I believe in God, the Father. And we highlighted the different attributes or characteristics of a good father. Biological father as well as a spiritual father. The father engenders or regenerates life. The father provides for the family on a material, emotional, moral, and spiritual plane. Father is called to educate his family. Father is also called to defend and protect his family. Those are four of the characteristics of a good father. <clears throat> then, yesterday we talked about, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And we spoke about the attributes of God. In the diary of St. Faustina, Jesus says to St. Faustina that St. Faustina that one way in which we can get to know God better is by meditating upon meditating upon his attributes. So by meditating upon his attributes, God is eternal, God is infinite, God is all wise, God is all loving, God is omniscient, means he knows everything, God is omnipotent, meaning that God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. <clears throat> so we spoke about God's power. God's power. And then today, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Creator. So that's the word we'll speak about today. God is the Creator. And I'd invite all of you, if you really want to understand God is Creator, after our class, to open up your Bible to the very first book of the Bible. the very first book of the Bible, and you see the book of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. These are the two chapters that we find on creation. These are two chapters on creation, two different versions or perspectives. And if we t were to define, to define what creation is, it means theologically to create is to bring something out of nothing. We often use the word created in a more metaphorical sense. Like I can say, I can, I can create a blog article by, I can create a book by writing a book. 
that would be a more metaphorical way of understanding it. But technically, theologically, to create is to bring something out of nothing. There you see it in chapter 1 and 2 of the book of Genesis. Chapter 1 and 2 of the book of Genesis. And why? Why of creation? <laughs> Excuse me. Well, you know, God did not have to create. God in his very nature, he's self-sufficient. God in his very nature is self-sufficient. He didn't have to create. Thomas Aquinas says that <laughs> love is expensive. If you love, you want to give and you want to share. John Paul II calls this the very gift of self. He calls it the very gift of self. But God is self-sufficient. <laughs> God did not create because he was born, born in heaven and he wanted to entertain himself by creating the human person. No. God creates out of love. It's called the gift of self. So much more can be said on this topic. But I like to move uh, and I'll be keep I'll keep up with with giving us brief catechetical thoughts so that you also can become catechists in your own right, within your own domain. So today I'd like to go through the readings So today we see in, in, in Mark chapter 3, I'll give you a summary of it. Jesus is preaching, he's teaching, he's healing, and many, many people are coming to Christ. He is like a human magnet. He's attracting people to himself. Don't forget that Jesus Christ is the Son of God made man. The sick, the lame, the blind, the paralytics, the lepers, they are come to Christ and Christ is healing them. And he's even have to get in he'll have to get in a boat, otherwise they're gonna crush him. So what can we say about Christ today? is he is the divine physician. He's the healer of body and soul, but also Jesus Christ is the divine master. Not only do they come to be healed, but also they come, they come to listen to Jesus to preach the truth. Now I'd like to say this about all of us. I think we're called to be, in a good, the good sense of the word, a, a human sponge when we come to perseverance. Such that we're called to, to listen, to assimilate, and to absorb. And then, you know what a sponge that is absorbs and then we're called to be wrung out. Do you like that? So we're called in our perseverance classes or encounters to absorb the, the truth, but then to give the truth to others by being wrung out. 
That's why I always invite you to, to share our message with your many friends. So we can preach the Word of God. We can preach the Word of God to the whole world. Jesus said, go out to the whole world and teach what I taught you. So we see Jesus Christ like he's a like he's a magnet really attracting people to himself. He's he's healing them of their infirmities. But he's teaching them. And Jesus would sometimes he would sometimes teach them at great length. He'd preach teach them at great length. That's right. He would teach them at great length. So there we have the uh, the gospel, and we have to admit, trying to apply this to ourselves, we all have our own maladies or sicknesses. We have our memory to be healed. We have our understanding to be healed. We have our imagination to be healed. We should ask, Lord, heal me. We have our emotions to be healed. We have our our soul to be healed. We've got bodily ailments. We should say, Lord Jesus Christ, divine physician, heal me. And with respect to the moral wounds, either we will be a a wounded wounder or a wounded healer, in the words of Henri Nguyen, a very famous theologian of last century. I repeat, either we will be a wounded wounded, wounded wounder or a wounded healer. Let's pray that we would be a wounded healer by going to the wounds of Christ. By his wounds we are healed. That we will be a, a a wounded healer in a very broken world. Now talking about woundedness, talking about woundedness, that takes us right into the first reading. The first reading today is taken from, once again, First Samuel, Both chapter 18 and 19. <clears throat> so I have to give you a summary. And this is my style. Is I like to summarize, to paraphrase, so to speak, the biblical passage. I like to give you after summarizing it, I'd like to give you the interpretation. And after giving you the interpretation, I'd like to give you the application. So it's summary of the biblical text, a clear and cogent interpretation, and then a practical application to our own lives. So here we have it. The church is giving us just some key parts of the gospel because of, uh, rather, the, 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 the Bible, because of the utter length of the Word of God. But just to refresh your memory, you remember yesterday, if you're following the readings, is that um, the Philistines challenge the Philistines challenge the Israelites to choose their best fighter or soldier and have a battle. So the Philistines chose Goliath. And David offers himself. So they go to the battlefield, and 
for all extents and purposes, obviously David should lose because of many factors. Goliath is a giant. He's muscular. He's strong. He's got armor. He has an armor bearer. He has a lot of experience. He's filled with malice. Whereas David is small, very little experience, doesn't have an arm bearer, doesn't have a big sword like Goliath. He just has a slingshot and a few stones. That's all he has. So Goliath looks at David and, and sneers at him. And he says that he calls him a dog. You come at me like a dog. And David says, listen to him. And he says, I'm going to chop your head off and throw your body to the birds of the field. David, fearless, says, you'll come in the name of your false gods, but I come in the name of God of heaven and earth. So David runs to the battle line, takes a stone out of his pocket. He uh, positions it in his slingshot, and he aims and he launches the stone, which flies toward the head of Goliath. It hits the forehead of Goliath. It rivets itself in the forehead, and Goliath comes crashing down to the ground, unconscious. David, now looking at Goliath, unconscious with the stone riveted in his forehead, he runs up to Goliath. Goliath is there with his sword laying on the ground. David takes the sword of Goliath, dispatches it, and decapitates Goliath, cutting off his head. So we see this unforgettable victory of David. This unforgettable victory of David. I like to compare this <clears throat> to our own world in which we're all called, we're all surrounded by many Goliaths. That's right, we're all surrounded by many Goliaths in the world today. We have to have our slingshot. Now this is our slingshot. This is our slingshot, that's right. This is our slingshot. And Agnes has played plays whole, how Mother Mary and the Rosa won the, the Impossible Battle of Lepanto and saved Christendom. GoodCatholic.com Thank you very much, Agnes. That's one of the most powerful examples of the victory of the Marian slingshot, the rosary. So we're living, we're living in very difficult times. So now more than ever, we have to wield our, our arm, our weapon. The great Padre Pio, who spent many hours in the confessional, he had this stigmata of 50 years. Padre Pio would sometimes say to some of his friends, give me my weapon. Give me my weapon. And they would look at him, well, you're a, you're a priest, you're a Franciscan, you shouldn't have a weapon. St. Francis said, make me a channel of your peace. What do you mean by that? Give me your weapon. What he was, what he was thinking about what he was thinking about was his spiritual weapon, which is the rosary. And Padre Pio was known to pray many rosaries every day. Many rosaries every day. <clears throat> Give me my weapon. 
I mentioned the African bishop, I think in my Spanish class, the Nigerian African bishop that's surrounded by the Boko Haram, burning down churches, kidnapping, ravishing women. And he was praying and he saw Jesus dressed in white with a sword. Then he saw the sword was turned into a rosary. And the bishop recognized that to win the battle, he should pray the rosary as well as get as many get as many get as many of the priest and parishion to pray the rosary. And they started to pray and the wor the working the attacks of Bokaram diminished. Not totally because they're still out there. So we have to wield our weapon our spiritual weapon. So let's let's dive into the reading for today. Let's dive in the reading for today. So David David is going out to battle and uh, he has these victories. Saul has his victories too. And don't forget that Saul is the king of Israel and David is one of his followers. But Dave, God has endowed David with many special gifts with uh, many, many special gifts. With many special gifts. Now, many special gifts, among which would be this military prowess where David is able to conquer the enemy. So there we have it. So David, we're, we're jumping forward. David is winning battles. Saul is winning battles. So, as they're walking in procession you have the women came out from each of the cities of Israel to meet King Saul they were singing and dancing with tambourines and joyful songs and sistrums. So the women played and sang. This would be the <coughs> the lyrics of what they were singing. <coughs> Saul has slain his thousands Saul has slain his thousands, and David has slain his ten thousands. So try to get the context. There, cities of Israel, they come out to meet King Saul joyfully singing the songs with their tambourines, their sistrins, and they're dancing with joy. Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his ten thousands. Now Saul, upon hearing this, Saul, upon hearing this, becomes 
very angry. and resentful of this song. You sing it well, you know, they're <coughs> they're giving me thousand, but David ten thousands. And then Saul reasons the only thing that that is left is that they're gonna give him the kingship. is that they're going to give him the kingship. So, sacred scripture points out from, from that day on, from that day on, Saul, Saul was jealous of David. Saul was jealous of David from that time on. Can you see what happens? How really ugly sin is. And how one sin can lead to another sin. Jealousy and envy are very much related. Envy, my friends, envy, my friends, is one of the one of the seven capital sins. If you remember. Gluttony, lust. Avarice, sloth, anger, envy, and pride. Those are the seven capital sins. That they are our, they are our spiritual DNA, <clears throat> which comes with being conceived and born with original sin. Those are the capital sins, these bad tendencies we have within us. St. Thomas Aquinas will, will give us the word concupiscence or fomi peccati. Concupiscence, fomi peccati. Concupiscence means the tendencies, the inclinations the proclivities toward evil that we all have within us. Jealousy and envy are related, but envy is a little bit worse. And I'll give you a succinct definition of both of them. And Sophie is um, doing a good job as secretary with the help of Carmen. Jealousy is one of the capital sins, and it can be t defined as, I feel bad because someone has something that I don't have. You might put in parentheses, comparisons. I'll repeat. Jealousy is, I feel bad because someone has something I don't have. And in parentheses, comparisons. We end up by comparing ourselves to others. The spiritual writers say comparisons are odious. They're very ugly. Comparisons are odious. They're very ugly. Now, envy is a little bit worse. Envy is the following. I feel bad because someone has something I don't have. And then there's an added clause, and I rejoice when something bad happens to him.
I repeat, feel bad because someone has something I don't have. And then I rejoice when something bad happens to him. That we're going to be seeing in these readings from the first reading of Samuel. Come and just, I'll give you a, <clears throat> a modern example <clears throat> of this. And it, you, you can find jealousy and envy in all different fields. But I'll try to give you one I think that we can understand in the modern work environment. Okay, say for example, you okay, you're working. You're working 20 years in the same company. And a young person comes in with with perhaps better technical electronic modern skills and within a couple of months within a couple of months This person has ascended and is receiving the same salary that you are. You've been working there for 20 years. And you're comparing your salary to her salary, your benefits to her benefits, and she's on the same level that you are you're in your 40s, she's just 20, 24 years old. You could be, you could actually be her mother. But you're simmering and you're steaming inside because she's getting the same pay as you are and the same benefits. And you've been working there for 20 years. So this, this really bothers you quite a bit. And you're thinking, like Saul is thinking about David, that Saul wants to harm David. Saul wants to eliminate David so that he can have his position of authority as king and be respected and honored by all the people. So you notice that this young woman is always coming in 10 minutes late. 10 minutes late. And you know that your boss is very persnickety and very demanding on punctuality. So you, in a certain sense, tattletale on this young woman. You tell your boss, you know, she's always coming in 10 minutes late. It's happened every day for the past week. <clears throat> I don't think that that's very professional. That's not going to help our company. It's not good. So you tell your boss this and as a result the following Monday this young woman does not show up does not show up for work. And you turn to your boss and you ask, well, what, what happened? She didn't even show up today. Oh, your boss says, well, I was really thinking about what you said, that in our company we have to be very professional 
and one of our team members is always showing up late. That's not professional work ethic. So I decided, I told her last Friday that she would be fired. So, so she's gone. So after you hear this within the depths of your heart, you're rejoicing because something bad has happened. Something bad has happened to this uh, this young worker that had arrived at your level in a matter of a couple of months. And I think that all of you, I think that all of you can understand that story that I've told you. It's very, very uh, prevalent in the world, in the work world. There's a lot of, we, we live in, in a kind of a difficult world. A difficult world. Where there is uh, jealousy, there is envy, there is rivalry. There is cheese maze. There is backbiting. There is bitterness. There's over. There's a. There's an overweening pride today. So, I thought I would tell you that. That anecdote that I've created, but it's really it's real life. Related. To what we're going through between King Saul and David. So what you have here, my friends, you might even call it the chain effect or the domino effect. Saul, Saul listens to the victories of David the victories of David as the women are crying out Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands then he compares himself to David then he becomes angry <coughs> and he becomes jealous envious, angry, and resentful. And this will grow, grow. It's like if you have a cut, and if you don't tend to that cut, it's very easy that that cut can get infected. It can get infected. So what's going to happen in the person of Saul is that this is going to turn into really not only anger, resentment, it's going to turn into, into hatred. Such that Saul will eventually Saul will eventually even try to kill David. Now there's another beautiful reflection in this is that Saul has a son whose name is Jonathan and Jonathan has a, a great a deep friendship with David so Jonathan has a deep friendship with David but also Saul highly respects the intelligence and the wisdom of his son, Jonathan. So Jonathan takes his father, Saul, aside because Saul has confided in Jonathan that he wants to, he basically wants to eliminate David. Get him out of the scene. Kill him. So Jonathan, hearing this, pulls his father aside and says, Look, Dad, there's no reason why you should do this. 
David has just helped you in your military victories. He's not your enemy. He's helped you in your military victories. So Jonathan helps his father to enter into a state of reflection, to reflect upon the reality that David has no intention of taking your kingship away. He's just there to help you as one of your loyal servants. Temporarily, temporarily this placates it subdues the anger of his father. It subsides at least temporarily. So we see that Jonathan is a peacemaker. He tries to reconcile his father with David. And David is innocent. So I'd like all of us to reflect upon this. As Sophie says, this has been a wisdom conversation. I believe it has been. Is that we're all tempted in many ways. The remedy for this is a, the words of St. Paul in our relationships with others. And I'll give you the verse. And perhaps Sophie can write this down. St. Paul says we should rejoice with those who rejoice and we should weep with those who weep. Your victory is my victory. Your failure is my failure. We're in the same family, the same team together. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So my friends, I invite you to share our wisdom conversation with your friends. Share it far and wide. And I'd like to give all of you my priestly blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless all of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God bless all of you, and we'll see you same time, same channel tomorrow. Many blessings.